Monday, July 30th, 1973, East Liverpool, Ohio. It's a hot, sunny summer day, the kind where most activity often slows to a crawl. At around 12.30 p.m., 75-year-old Earl Tweed places a call to a family member from his furniture store on Dresden Avenue. At around the same time, 22-year-old Linda Morris and her four-year-old daughter, Angela, set out from their home on Lincoln Avenue, just a few blocks away. Linda is roughly four months pregnant with her second child and wants to talk to Mr. Tweed about a larger apartment. Just what happened over the next 25 minutes has puzzled and confounded law enforcement for nearly half a century. That day the East Liverpool Police Department found themselves facing a tragic scenario they never imagined could play out in their town. A quadruple homicide. To say that East Liverpool was shaken by the events of July 30th, 1973 would be a colossal understatement. In one fell swoop, an elderly resident, a young mother, her four-year-old daughter, an unborn child all had their lives ended in a brutal manner. A manner so heinous that many believed a serial killer must have passed through East Liverpool. The situation was made doubly frustrating when it became apparent that no one had gotten a good, clear look at the killer. Although nearly 50 years have now passed since that tragic day, many in law enforcement continue to hold out hope for a break in the case. A witness who was previously too scared to come forward, someone who may have heard the killer brag about or lament his actions, or perhaps the killer himself is now seeking a long overdue unburdening of the soul. East Liverpool, Ohio is located just across the Ohio River from the tip of West Virginia's northern panhandle. For much of its existence, it was the very epitome of a northern industrial community. Like its neighbors, Steubenville, Wheeling, and Pittsburgh, East Liverpool was a factory city, inhabited primarily by hard-working and often hard-nosed blue-collar workers, many of them engaged in the porcelain and pottery industry. Another notch in the great northern steel belt. Until the economic downturn of the 1970s, East Liverpool's claim to fame was rather dubious, but no less intriguing. For it was here, in 1934, that famous or infamous gangster Charles Pretty Boy Floyd met his end. An event preserved for eternity at East Liverpool's Police Museum, a tribute to the town and law enforcement in general. Here, the life, times, and terminus of Pretty Boy's exploits are on display for all to behold, including a mold of his death mask. While the walls and hallways of this establishment are replete with tales of crimes gone by, there is one tragic episode for which you will see no shrine or display, and this is not by accident. Charles Floyd's life of crime came to a brutal and very definite end. Case closed. However, the same cannot be said for the brutal killings which shook this once quiet, blue-collar town to its foundation. You will see nothing depicting the brutal murders of Earl Tweed, Linda Morris, and Angela Morris, because their case, to this day, remains open and active. 
The case is simultaneously both well-documented and frustratingly lacking in hard facts. Somehow, during the lunch hour of a quiet, hot summer's day, someone managed to snuff out four lives in less than 25 minutes and then make such an effective escape that they were apparently seen by no one. Even more puzzling, the nature of the killings was such that it would have been virtually impossible for the killer to have not been liberally splashed with blood. And yet, no bloody footprints, no bloody clothing, no bloody killer seen fleeing in full view of more than a dozen homes and businesses. Today, the neighborhood where the slayings occurred has changed very little. Each day, people still walk and drive by this modest, unassuming building along Dresden Avenue. Even 50 years on, it is fair to say that a great many of them still look in wonder at the brick and wood facade as they pass. Many of them stare and ponder the many theories which the killings have spawned. Others stare and simply want one thing, justice. Thanks to the help of the East Liverpool Police Museum, Police Department, and Historical Society, we will attempt to reconstruct, to the best of our ability, the events surrounding these brutal killings. We will pinpoint known locations of importance and areas where the killer may have been and when. We will endeavor to show what these locations looked like, both in 1973 and today. And we will try, try, to make some sense out of the confusing and often contradictory series of events. Events which began to unfold during the sultry morning hours of Monday, July 30th, 1973. As East Liverpool and the rest of America headed into yet another work week, life, for the most part, had been lively but largely routine. That morning, talk around the water coolers probably revolved around President Nixon's former chief domestic advisor, John Ehrlichman. His sixth appearance before the Senate committee investigating the so-called Watergate affair was to conclude that morning, broadcast live to millions of curious viewers. Others may have been discussing the astronauts aboard the ailing Skylab, and their ongoing battles against both leaks and motion sickness. Alternatively, perhaps talk revolved around inflation and the rising cost of gas and consumer goods. In East Liverpool, life was also going on as it normally did, at a near lethargic late summer's pace. School would not reconvene for another month, so children of all ages were out and about, soaking up summer's radiance while they had the chance. That morning, 75-year-old resident Earl Tweed left his home on West 3rd Street to begin another week. Tweed, born in Steubenville, had made his home in East Liverpool since 1912. Locally, he was known as an active property owner, landlord, and member of the local Moose and Masonic Lodges. He was also an eagle, a Templar, and a Royal Arch Pilgrim. Earl opened his business, the National Furniture Store, when he first came to East Liverpool. He eventually set up shop in this single-story building along the busy thoroughfare known as Dresden Avenue. While once dominated by factories and warehouses, much of the neighborhood had morphed into a kind of semi-urban suburbia by 1973. National Furniture, along with several other stores, lined the western side of the street, while the eastern side was dominated by private homes. National Furniture was located just four blocks from the city center and only six blocks away from the police department. Not much about Earl's early morning activities has been made public. At some point, he made a small cash deposit at his bank, a deposit reported to have been less than $100. We also know from a contemporary news account that he was visited at his store at approximately 11 a.m. by Mr. Charles Inman. 
Hinman, it was reported, was a part-time employee of Mr. Tweed. At the time, Inman resided at 225 West 8th Street, just behind the National Furniture Store. The home has since been demolished, but would have been located here. During his lunch hour at approximately 12.30 p.m., Earl made a telephone call to one of his relatives. This is the last documented contact with Earl Tweed before he was killed. Around this same time period, Earl began preparing lunch in his office, located on the left or southern side of the store. Whatever transpired inside the furniture store over the next 20 to 25 minutes is not entirely clear. Also around the same time, Linda Morris, along with her four-year-old daughter Angela, was en route to the National Furniture Store from her home on Lincoln Avenue. Her home was located here and has since been demolished. Her trek from her home to National Furniture was an easy walk of just two blocks, literally all downhill. Coincidentally, Linda's husband, Arthur Lewis Morris, an employee of the East Liverpool Street Department, was working on a municipal project along Ridgeway Street, less than a hundred yards away from National Furniture. Earl Tweed's telephone call to his relative was apparently quite short, as authorities have maintained that the time frame of 12.30 through 12.55 p.m. is the crucial span in determining what happened. What we do know for certain is that during this short interval, the lives of Earl Tweed and Linda Morris were violently taken, and four-year-old Angela Morris was mortally wounded. At approximately 12.55 p.m., Daniel Dugan and his wife Frances, both residents of Chicago, pulled up in front of the National Furniture Store. The pair were shopping around for antiques and decided to patronize Mr. Tweed's establishment. Owing to difficulty in walking, Daniel Dugan remained in the car while his wife made her way into the store via the single front door. She had barely crossed the threshold when she was met with a gruesome sight as well as a heart-wrenching sound. Lying upon a bent mattress a few feet in front of her was the lifeless body of Linda Morris. Just to her left, the mortally wounded Angela Morris also lay upon the floor, still crying out in pain. A significant amount of blood was present. Reports of Mrs. Dugan's reaction to her discovery are contradictory. Early reports stated that she retreated to the store's doorway and shouted out for someone to call the police. A later report states that Dugan, a trained nurse, calmly exited the store and walked diagonally across the street to a service station where she phoned the police. However she managed it, Mrs. Dugan's call to the East Liverpool Police Department was answered by Patrolman Michael Penrod at precisely 12.56 p.m. Within minutes, news of the slaying had been flashed to all units. Patrolman Victor Wolf was the first to arrive on the scene. Finding Angela Morris still alive, but only just so, he picked her up and removed her from the scene. Angela was transported by ambulance to the city hospital with several severe wounds to her head. Sadly, Angela Morris succumbed to her injuries at 1.56 p.m. the same day. The area in front of the National Furniture Store was soon a sea of humanity. Chief Amerika Radeshi, upon learning of the killings, rushed to the scene along with Detective William Devon and Ken Montgomery. The trio arrived at approximately 1.10 p.m. By this time, the crowd and crush of vehicles around the National Furniture Store had grown even larger. Captain Kenneth Mooney, who would normally have taken charge of the case, was away on vacation and would not return until the following day. As such, the first day of the initial investigation was handled by Detective William Devon. In addition to Linda Morris, officers on the scene also discovered the lifeless body of Earl Tweed. 
Tweed was discovered further inside and towards the rear of the building. He had not previously been noticed owing to a large collection of household items and tools piled up in the area. Tweed had sustained serious wounds to his left side, chest, and head. Unfortunately, the rapid arrival of onlookers, combined with the unusually brutal nature of the killings, resulted in the crime scene being somewhat compromised. Local residents, including the owner of the local radio station, were able to make their way inside of the store, literally walking through puddles of blood and tracking it in and out of the front door. Any hope of identifying the killer or killers by their footprints was dashed. Once enough manpower was on hand, authorities did their best to secure and examine the scene. The body of Earl Tweed was found in this general area, down a V-shaped hallway comprised of mattresses and other used furniture, and near the door to his office. In spite of the disturbance, the crime scene was far from void of evidence. Earl Tweed's desk, located in his office to the left of the hallway, appeared to have been rifled as specks and smears of blood were observed amidst a jumble of papers. On a chair near the desk, police found two slices of bread and a slice of meat, indicating that Earl may have been in the process of preparing his lunch when he was first disturbed. It was also ascertained that Earl Tweed's wallet was missing. The body of Linda Morris was found closer to the front door. She was lying face up on the lower part of a king-sized mattress which had been propped up against the right-hand side of the makeshift wall. The mattress had sunk into a sideways U shape, and Linda was atop the portion lying on the floor. Mrs. Dugan and Officer Wolf later advised that Linda's daughter Angela had been found a few feet to the left of Linda's body and slightly closer to the front door. The cluttered interior of Tweed's store was full of tools and other implements which could easily have been used as instruments of murder. Among other items, police located a twisted section of pipe, a claw hammer, an eight-inch serrated steak knife, and a wrench. Any, all, or none of them could have inflicted the wounds which were observed. Curiously, no defensive-type wounds were found on any of the victims. Linda Morris's purse was found a few feet from where her body was lying. Authorities believed she had been assaulted in this area as opposed to where she was found. The killer, for whatever reason, apparently saw fit to drag her body away from her purse and onto the upturned mattress. The purse had also been rifled through. Earl Tweed did not use a cash register, instead making change for purchases from his wallet. The rifled purse, combined with Earl's missing wallet, indicated that the killings may have been the result of a robbery gone bad. However, the cramped and cluttered state of the store's interior made it nearly impossible to ascertain if anything else had been stolen or if the killer had utilized makeshift weapons found at the scene. Later that day, representatives of the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation and Identification arrived to help with the forensic examination. Once the scene was as secure as possible, the bodies of Linda Morris and Earl Tweed were removed and taken to the county coroner's office for autopsies. In each case, death had resulted from multiple blows to the head. While news of the horrific event began to spread, police themselves fanned out in search of clues. Given that the slayings had occurred during the busy lunch hour of a Monday, hopes may have been high that several sets of eyes and ears had been tuned in to the events. Sadly, any hopes of the kind would prove false. In the first of several ways, the killer was either very lucky or very smart. From the outside of the National Furniture Store, the interior was entirely obscured from view by furniture, appliances, and other decorations. 
Equally as frustrating, the many mattresses and other large bits of furniture had turned the store's interior into a virtual sound booth. No one, including part-time employee Charles Inman, reported hearing any loud noises, screams, or cries for help between 12.30 and 12.55. A canvas of nearby residents turned up four witnesses who reported having seen a man run from the store prior to the discovery of the murders. One witness, a youth who has never been publicly identified, claim that the supposed killer literally bumped into him while exiting the store and verbally threatened him. The youth managed to break free and fled, unharmed. As far as we know, no one has come forward who claimed to have seen the killer enter the store. Later that afternoon, police received a call reporting that a scattering of personal papers had been found spread along a set of wooden steps adjacent to this freeway exit. Police responded to the area and examined the papers. It was immediately apparent that the various bits of ephemera had belonged to Earl Tweed. Police searched the area, literally from top to bottom. At the top of the steps, police found Earl Tweed's discarded wallet between a cyclone fence and Ridgeway Street. There was no cash inside. Police now knew that the killer or killers had managed to flee at least as far as Highway 30, a four-lane stretch of road leading north to Calcutta and south to Chester, West Virginia. Two days later, a sanitation employee made another crucial discovery not far from the bottom of the wooden steps. Within a trash bin located here, the worker happened upon a paper sack. Inside, he found a bloodied pair of upholsterer's shears and a claw hammer. The weapons were later determined to have inflicted the head wounds of all three victims and a massive wound to Earl Tweed's left side. The killer's escape route was beginning to take shape. Word of the multiple killings had been spread across the nation, and police were fielding tips as fast as they came in. Diligent work by the BCINI had turned up several latent fingerprints. These, along with other physical evidence found at the scene, was sent to the police lab in London, Ohio, for examination. In retrospect, it appears that confidence was high. Police indicated that an arrest was all but imminent. Unfortunately, they would soon suffer a series of devastating setbacks and delays, the ripple effects of which are still being felt to this day. From the day of the murders, rumors had circulated about an alleged man with bushy red hair. For a while, it was believed that this man, whoever he was, was the prime suspect. He had definitely been observed running away from the National Furniture Store. However, once located, it was learned that the man had happened upon the scene just after the killings had been discovered and was fleeing the scene, but in fear rather than guilt. The families of the victims did their best to help. Earl Tweed's family advised authorities that he usually carried in his wallet two one-dollar bills, which had been given to him by his children. On the bills, the words Daddy, XX, and OO had been written in either red or blue ink. Essentially, they reported that the killer may have made off with marked bills. Police actively pursued this lead. They made the details public and urged the public to be on the lookout for dollar bills matching the description. As if on cue, dollar bills matching the general description released by authorities began turning up, some as far away as Steubenville. Police investigated what appeared to be another promising lead, only to later be advised by the Tweed family that Earl Tweed had ceased to carry the bills several years previous. The bills in question were later found in the possession of another family member. Each and every bill which turned up were no more than cruel and tasteless pranks. No witnesses, no traceable bills, a compromised crime scene, 
and the unwanted interloping of practical jokers. By September of 1973, the investigation had effectively stalled, save for the faint hope that another informer or eyewitness would come forward. This state of affairs persists to this day. From the outset, authorities and armchair sleuths alike were stymied by the apparent lack of any genuine witness to either the killer's appearance or escape. Based upon the configuration of the neighborhood and the locations where the wallet, hammer, and shears were found, police had mapped out two likely routes of escape the killer would have taken. Here again, the killer was either very lucky were very knowledgeable of his surroundings. In 1973, the National Furniture Store was located in this neighborhood, just four blocks to the north and west of the city's commercial center. This is how the area appeared in 1971, two years prior to the murders. A comparison with a modern-day map shows just how little the area has changed in over half a century. This fact is even more apparent from ground level. Standing at National Furniture's front door, one can turn a full 180-degree circle and, with very few exceptions, see essentially the same thing one would have seen in 1973. This is equally astounding when a map from 2023 is compared with a map from 1923. Aside from the absence of the Thomas & Sons ceramic factory, the layout of the streets and the location of buildings are remarkably similar to what they are today. Anyone growing up in East Liverpool during the 1930s, 40s, or 50s would, in all likelihood, still recognize many sections of the city. Assuming he was not overly blessed with luck, could this have been what gave the killer a brief edge over law enforcement? A home field advantage? The brutality of the murders shocked the public as well as the law enforcement community. Like any city in 1973, East Liverpool was not immune from crime. Drug use, shoplifting, public intoxication, and cat burglaries were just as frequent as any place else. However, the slayings of Earl Tweed, Linda Morris, and Angela Morris was something unheard of in East Liverpool. Not since the days of Pretty Boy Floyd had so much blood been spilt in Columbiana County. To this end, local residents found it hard to believe that the killer had come from their own ranks. Initial theories revolved around a possible transient or a drug-crazed criminal from Pittsburgh or some other large city. However, several aspects of the crime did seem to point to someone with at least a rudimentary knowledge of the city and its populace. To wit, how could the killer have known that effective cover from witnesses, pedestrians, and most other residents could be found less than 100 feet from the crime scene? Luck? Chance? Or had they been there before? Perhaps a former resident who had gone away to the big city and returned with a grudge or vengeance? Whatever the case, the route taken by the killer after he exited the National Furniture Store was and remains crucial to ascertaining his identity. In short, the direction the killer took after the murders would determine just who could have seen him, where, and when. As previously stated, police had mapped out two routes the killer could have taken after exiting the National Furniture Store. We will now examine each of these routes in detail. Whenever possible, we will illustrate the differences and similarities between 2023 and 1973. We do not know the exact time the killer exited the National Furniture Store. Earl Tweed made a telephone call to a relative at 12.30 p.m. and Francis Dugan entered the store at 12.55 p.m. Given that Angela Morris was still alive when Dugan arrived, we will proceed on the assumption that the killer left the scene in the latter portion of this time frame, 
around 12.47 p.m. During the next three to four minutes, the killer would, at various times, have been visible to either businesses, private homes, or both. Although nearly 50 years have passed, it is hoped that anyone living in or passing through these areas may have seen something of consequence. More directly, it is at these places and at these times that the killer may have been seen making his escape. Please, pay close attention to these locations and times. For the killer, the first few seconds of his escape would have been the most dangerous. In 1973, the properties directly across Dresden Street from the National Furniture Store were all occupied by houses. Again, it was summertime, lunchtime, a good weather day, and television coverage of the Senate Watergate hearings with John Ehrlichman center stage had taken a break for lunch at 12.30. It would not be unreasonable to assume that a covered front porch would have been an inviting venue. Today, the door the killer would have exited is covered by wood paneling. We will call this point A. Stepping out onto the sidewalk, this would have been the killer's first general view, wide open and in full view of anyone within a radius of 180 degrees, most of which is elevated. Photographs taken later during the crime scene investigation show no vans, trucks, or other large vehicles parked along Dresden Avenue. Also, the nature of the killings would have made it virtually impossible for the killer not to have been noticeably covered with blood. To many, it boggles the mind to think that no one at this time and place saw a blood-soaked, likely frantic individual running or stumbling out of a screen door. Also, at this point in his escape, the killer would have been carrying the paper sack containing the upholsterer's shears and claw hammer, items not easily concealed. The killer's next move would have only increased his visibility. To reach cover as quickly as possible, he would have turned right and proceeded down this sidewalk in a generally southern direction, he would have passed in front of what was then the Bethel Gospel Tabernacle, a street-level walk-in church. Moving south would have only brought him into clearer view of a service station situated diagonally across Dresden Avenue. Again, this was during the noon hour, when both vehicular and pedestrian traffic would have at least been moderate. From here, the killer would make a sharp turn to his right onto a beige brick thoroughfare, formerly known as West 8th Street. It is here that the killer's best hope for cover begins. Twenty to thirty feet down this rough, uneven path, and one is effectively hidden from anyone on Dresden Avenue. The grading of the street progresses steadily downward and buildings on either side rise up to cover the flanks. Even in 1973, it was reported that this former roadway was seldom traversed by either wheel or foot. Many businesses along the way were already shuttered and the undulation of the brick surface made driving very difficult. Running and briskly walking, the time would have now been approximately 12.48 p.m. However, the killer would not quite have been out of the woods just yet. Even today, this route is flanked by four private residences and at least one active business. In 1973, the odds would have been even less favorable, as three additional homes, including the residence of Charles Inman, located here, were still present. At least seven chances for eyes to catch a glimpse of the killer during his flight. After passing the final private residence, number 762, the killer would have been confronted by this blunt-cornered building, shown here in a contemporary photograph. This we will designate as Point B. Here, the killer would have had two options. One, to continue on along the lightly traveled and heavily concealed West 8th Street, or two, to turn right 
proceed on an uphill grade along Starkey Street and eventually arrive at Ridgeway Avenue in full view of at least three homes and two businesses. We will cover this side route shortly. The prevailing theory among law enforcement is that the killer chose the first option and proceeded on along West 8th Street behind the abandoned Riggs Company and Weber Brewing buildings, the latter of which has since been demolished, but in 1973 towered a full seven stories over the narrow passage. Keeping to West 8th Street, the killer would have passed beneath the back of several residents located above and to his right. It should be noted, however, that the images being shown here were filmed in mid-January, whereas the killer would have been making his escape at the height of summer, when vegetation would almost certainly have been thicker. Making a slight bend to the left, the killer would have come alongside of what was then a Sohio service station. Here, he would have paused just long enough to place the paper bag containing the upholsterer's shears and claw hammer into a trash barrel. Today, as in 1973, this action would have barely, if at all, increased the killer's exposure. The time would now have been approximately 12.49 p.m. His next move would have been a bit more daring. In order to make it to the wooden steps, the killer would have had to traverse the northern edge of the Sohio lot, passing in front of these two structures. At this point, the time of day may have worked to his favor, as a service station so close to a highway off-ramp would, more often than not, be very busy perhaps too busy for anyone to have noticed the killer. Upon reaching the base of the steps, the killer's exposure would again have been greatly reduced. Today, the steps are made of concrete. However, in 1973, the stairway was comprised of wooden boards. The killer would have ascended this long stretch of stairs, rifling through Earl Tweed's wallet and discarding his papers along the way. The time would now have been approximately 12.50 p.m. Reaching the top of the steps, the killer would have found himself in this neighborhood, again in full view of several private homes. A comparison of the 1971 aerial photograph with a modern view shows that the area remains virtually unchanged today. Here, the killer would have tossed or dropped Earl Tweed's wallet in this general area. This we will designate as point C1. And from here, the killer's next move is pure conjecture. Allowing the killer time to discard the wallet and ponder his next move would now place the time at approximately 12.51 p.m. The alarm would not be raised for at least another four minutes, enough time for the killer to have quickly traversed another quarter to half mile on foot or multiple miles by car. Had the killer remained on foot, his visibility to private homes would only have increased with each step. Going straight would have only taken him back in the direction of Dresden Avenue, Turning left would have taken him along a downhill grade to West 9th Street. But what if the killer took the proverbial high road? Returning to point B, the killer is faced with the choice of staying on West 8th Street or turning right onto Starkey Street. This would have taken him along an uphill grade out of the ring of factories and into suburbia. In order to place the wallet, its contents, and the murder weapons where they were found, the killer would have next turned left onto Ridgeway Avenue and proceeded one block to the west, passing in front of no fewer than 15 private homes along the way. Ridgeway Street terminates at this fence, where the stairway back down to Weber Way is located. The killer would next have essentially replayed the last moves of his other route in reverse. He would have removed the contents of Earl Tweed's wallet, discarded the wallet near the fence, descended the steps and scattered the wallet's contents along the way, turned left at the base of the steps, 
stealthily cross the northern end of the Sohio lot and make his way to the trash barrel where the shears and hammer were found. This we will designate as point C2, a point which most feel is likely non-existent. This would have placed the killer in the unenviable position of having to backtrack no matter which way he turned and use up valuable time counting down to 12.55 p.m. when the alarm was raised. These routes are based upon educated supposition and are by no means set in stone. As in any case, the number of variations, however improbable, are virtually innumerable. However, points A, B, and C1 are considered to be the most probable based upon the locations of the evidence located and the amount of time required. Dates, times, addresses, directions, numbers, and facts all of which may eventually lead to the unmasking of a killer, but also miss the point entirely when it comes to the resulting emotions. In one tragic afternoon, Arthur Lewis Morris lost his wife, daughter, and unborn child. Mary Tweed lost her husband of nearly 50 years, and East Liverpool lost a part of itself. The decade of the 1970s would bring little joy to its residents as local industry crumbled and the steel belt began to rust. 1979 would cap the decade in the most depressing fashion. If you remember our feature on Evelyn Louise Davis, then you will recall that 1979 brought with it one final nightmare for East Liverpool, another triple homicide. Ironically enough, this vivid flashback to 1973 would play out less than one block from the spot where Earl Tweed, Linda, and Angela Morris breathed their last. Nearly half a century has passed since these brutal slayings. While the case has gone cold, it is far from petrified. To this day, the murders on Dresden Avenue remain a topic of conversation and occasionally contention. As with most unsolved homicides, interest is wont to rise and fall with no measurable pattern. It is not uncommon for each passing July 30th to briefly resurrect the grim tale and allow it once again to play out in the newspapers and on television. Sadly, with each passing year, the chances for a genuine resolution grow fainter. And yet, hope remains. Admittedly, the odds of a successful resolution to this case are not encouraging. All of the original investigators who worked the case in 1973 have long since passed away, along with many of the witnesses. Some members of law enforcement are of the opinion that the killer is now also deceased. While the opportunity to tie this case up with a bow on top may have passed by, many continue to hold out hope that new information in whatever shape or form is still out there. A genuine witness, a father confessor, perhaps even a handwritten note admitting guilt and asking forgiveness. All long shots, though not entirely out of the realm of possibility. After all, with cold cases, it only takes one set of eyes in the right place and at the right time. Maybe those eyes are now open and will be focused on the following summation. Perhaps those eyes belong to you. Earl Tweed, Linda Morris, and Angela Morris were all killed between 12.30 and 12.55 p.m on Monday, July 30th, 1973. All three were killed inside the walls of what was then the National Furniture and Antique Store, located at 759 Dresden Avenue. Police believe that Earl Tweed was killed first, possibly the result of a robbery gone wrong. Linda Morris and Angela Morris are believed to have been killed to eliminate them as witnesses. 
The exact time is not known, but at some point before 1255, the killer exited the National Furniture Store via the door which fronted onto Dresden Avenue. Several witnesses reported seeing a man running from the general vicinity, but no account was reliable enough to justify reporting a description to the public. The killer made his escape from the scene via a circuitous route along what was once called West 8th Street. The general consensus is that the killer kept to this route until he reached the northern flank of a Ohio service station. Here, he deposited a bag containing two weapons used in the killings, a pair of upholsterer shears and a claw hammer. The killer next made his way to this staircase, which ascends a hillside adjacent to an exit ramp from Highway 30. While climbing the steps, the killer discarded some of the contents of Earl Tweed's wallet. The wallet itself was discarded near the top of the steps, between a chain-link fence and Ridgeway Avenue. Just where the killer went from this point is unknown. Authorities would be interested in hearing from anyone who may have seen the killer while he was making his escape. Again, this would have occurred sometime between 12.30 and 12.55 p.m. Given that Angela Morris was still alive when the crime scene was discovered, many feel that the actual time would have been during the latter part of this 25-minute span. If you have any information concerning the murders of Earl Tweed, Linda Morris, and Angela Morris, please contact the East Liverpool, Ohio Police Department at 330-385-1234.